welcome everyone. Um, we're glad you're here today. We are here to present a personal safety training uh, for you all as a part of our programming uh, with the Office of Community and Civic Life and the Community Safety Program. Uh, we are here um, for about an hour today to present this, and I will say that usually this particular presentation can be up to two hours long, so we are going to be um, squeezing in a lot of content in the next hour, um, but we're really glad you're with us today and hope that you um, will be able to take away a lot of information um, and use it to apply to your personal safety concerns. So as we um, get into things, we're just going to do some introductions and acknowledgments about our training topic and about um, um, everybody that's here today. Uh, again, I am Sarah Burkmeyer. I am a community safety coordinator with the Office of Community and Civic Life, um, which is a bureau of the city of Portland government. Uh, and I'm here today with Jenny Pollan, um, who is also a community safety coordinator with the Office of Community and Civic Life. Um, and we are here to provide a presentation about personal safety. We have two facilitators that are managing this training. One will be speaking and one will be managing the PowerPoint and other tools that we have along with Wing, who's in the background there managing a lot of things as well. Um, we acknowledge that sometimes online learning is still a new process for folks and we're committed to respecting everyone's learning abilities and believe you know, we're all doing our best here today. Uh, and we acknowledge too that um, this particular topic um, is, it can be difficult for some people because you all have different experiences around safety and self-defense. Some of this may be review for you, but we also encourage you to learn with an open mind um, for new options and applications of these skills um, in ways that are most effective for your current situation. Um, usually this can be presented in person and it's a very interactive training when presented in person and so if you have the opportunity in the future once we get back to in-person trainings and work we encourage you to participate in this training again if you're interested uh, to get the most of this training that you can um, we encourage you to interact as much as possible um, you know via the chat um, or at, in other ways ask questions um, and we are happy to answer those questions as much as we can. Um, we uh, also acknowledge that in this training, you know, as with any safety related topic, there's potential to activate trauma in participants. So we're asking you to share personal experiences sometimes or think about personal experiences that you've had and considering your safety plans related to those experiences. And those experiences may have been traumatic. We want you to feel safe and take care of your needs please get support if anything comes up for you in the way that's most helpful for you. Uh, we also have a demographic survey that we would love to have folks fill out. If you have the time, we can put that in the chat. It is a short survey just about who you are and where you're coming from. It helps us to know who's participating in our training and who's not. Uh, we may be posting a few additional links in the chat as we go along. Um, so, with that, um, I will just say a little bit more about myself and then I'll let Jenny say a little bit about herself. Um, again, my name is Sarah. I've been doing this work with the Community Safety Program for about four and a half years. I have previous experience doing work in domestic violence advocacy and in community health education. And um, I'm really excited to be presenting this information to the community. It's a very requested training um, because of the um, issues of safety that do exist right now in our city. So I'll let Jenny quickly introduce herself as well. Good morning. Thank you for joining us for this uh, workshop. Um, I am Jenny Pullen. I've been with the city of Portland for about 15 years now. I have a background in criminology and criminal justice and a personal passion for uh, personal safety. I love teaching it and uh, helping folks learn new tools to help keep them and others safe. So thanks for joining us today. I think we're gonna have fun. Thank you, Jenny. All right, I just wanna quickly introduce our community safety program and um, uh, the strengths program, which is where this uh, personal safety training has been developed from. So community safety uh, provides holistic safety education for the public. And we, 
provide training. We provide uh, security assessments based on the principles of crime prevention through environmental design for properties around the city. Uh, we have partnerships and community building opportunities with the community. And we also provide consultation and referral around community safety issues. Uh, we partnered up with the um, Strength Program approximately two and a half years ago to create uh, personal safety training for folks around the city. Um, the Strength Program is uh, Women's Strength, Girls' Strength, and Boys' Strength. It's a program within the Portland Police Bureau that provides free holistic self-defense classes around the city of Portland for women and girls and free violence prevention classes for boys. Um, also within that program, they provide safety workshops just like we're doing today. So um, safety workshops are free, non-physical, um, self-defense and safety options open to all members of the community, not gender specific. Um, and all training and consultation that we provide both in the strength program and the community safety program is free um, and taxpayer supported as we like to say. So just a brief overview of what we're gonna be talking about today in this presentation. We will be thinking about some what ifs that might exist for you all in relation to your personal safety. We'll be talking about intuition and the instinct and what that means related to personal safety. We'll be talking about assertiveness and specifically a model of assertiveness that you might find helpful in setting boundaries with folks. We will be talking about de-escalation and some introductory skills in de-escalation. We'll be talking about your options for escape should a situation become physically unsafe for you to remain in. And we'll be talking about upstander intervention and then we'll do a quick review and wrap up at the end. So to get started, we wanna talk about our what ifs. And what we mean by that is we want to, we want you to think about why you came to this training today and what's important to you regarding your personal safety. Um, so what ifs can sometimes be questions about, um, you know, what if I'm being followed? What if somebody threatens me with a weapon? You want to think about things that are specific to your personal safety that you wish you knew how to better handle or something that's maybe already happened that you want to brainstorm a different way of handling it. Something that you have a fear about and maybe you're not sure how to make a plan to reduce that fear. So. Um, we we do have some examples of what ifs um, for you, and Jenny's going to put those on the screen. So these are just some examples that have come up in other trainings that we've provided, and may kind of um, help you to think about what your own what ifs are, and help um, guide this training for you, and so that you can get the most out of it that you need. So what if I'm followed to the bus stop after work? What if someone comes into my work and they are escalated and they're threatening? Um, now that I'm back in the office, uh, what if a colleague doesn't respect physical distancing rules, right? So these are just a few examples of um, personal safety concerns that people might have um, in participating in this training. And we encourage you to think about your own, maybe even write it down so that as we go through these options that we're going to be giving you, um, you can kind of think about, well, would that option work for my situation or, or will something else work instead, okay? All right, so we're gonna start by talking about instinct and intuition. And um, we're gonna be talking about a lot of different topics related to personal safety today, but this is one of the most valuable safety tools that we have. And it's a large component of our internal assertiveness. So think about what does what is your definition of instinct or intuition? For most people, instinct is our internal alarm system. It alerts us to dangers that are not always obvious, but are definitely real, right? So what is your body's response to intuition or instinct? People feel intuition in different ways, but usually there's some kind of physiological response, right? So there's sweating or maybe goosebumps, maybe a racing heart, panic, butterflies in your stomach, right? I'm sure we've all felt this at some point in time. So just think hard. How does this feel for me? How do I know when my intuition is kicking in? What does my body do in response? So why does intuition kick in? Well, it's our initial response to something 
that feels unfamiliar and may be causing a fear reaction. As I said before, it's our internal alarm system that's alerting us to something that we need to pay attention to and potentially act upon to stay safe. So what are the risks to trusting our intuition? Um, oftentimes, our intuition starts kicking in and we start thinking of all these different excuses as to why we shouldn't pay attention to it or why we shouldn't act on it, right? So going with your intuition can sometimes mean being willing to make a big scene, uh, to be embarrassed, to break social norms or rules, to be disliked, to escalate a situation. So it's a good time to mention that sometimes we have a fear reaction repeatedly to a whole group of people or a certain place. We want to think about that and how it relates to intuition. Um, if that's happening for you, think about that and why is that? Sometimes it's connected to bias, which is something we all have. This is a risk of trusting intuition. When you think about this ahead of time, though, when you're not in a crisis situation, you'll be better able to address bias and kind of tease that out from what your true intuition is. Um, and one example of how to work on this is that when you're out in public under safe circumstances, meaning you know, you're not feeling um, any kind of threat or any kind of uneasiness or uncomfortableness, um, you're considering your surroundings. Pay attention to those messages that are kind of playing in your head around who you choose to be close to or interact with. Um, are they consistently the same people? If you had to choose, quote unquote, safe people, who would you choose? And how is there perhaps some bias in your decisions as to who is safe and who is not? We also want to remember that sometimes we've had experiences of past trauma, or we've been kind of bombarded with these media messages around what is considered safe or unsafe. Consider how your life experiences or exposure to certain media may inform what feels like your intuitive response. Know your own fear reactions, your genuine fear reactions, and use them to aid you versus hinder you in a situation that feels unsafe. So we are the only animals that process our instinct. Um, think about kind of a fox and a rabbit and those animals and how that rabbit processes its instinct. It actually doesn't. So the rabbit doesn't stop and think about whether or not that fox is a threat when it's coming near. The rabbit just goes, right? Humans are the only animals that really stop and analyze, is this intuition? Is this thing really an um, unsafe situation? Is this person really an unsafe person? So we want to stop doing that. We want to stop playing that role of questioning our intuition and just trust it. When your instinct tells you that a situation is bad or a person might be dangerous, try to resist that temptation to ignore the feeling. The sooner you can act, the more likely you are to get away from the potential danger. Acting on your intuition, regardless of the criticism, the embarrassment, or the inconvenience that may result, can help prevent assault and keep us safer. All right. So with that and keeping intuition on our mind throughout this entire training, I'm going to pass it on to Jenny, who's going to talk to us about assertiveness and the role that that plays in our self, in our self-defense and in our personal safety. Thank you, Sarah. I also wanted to note that um, Alejandra had shared in the chat about a confrontation with a houseless person who's very angry. Um, and Alejandra tried ignoring this person, um, but he was screaming obscenities and threatening violence toward Alejandra and um, eventually went away. Uh, but having some de-escalation skills can help. And also we're going to talk about options for escape. Some situations just feel unsafe. And so you wanna turn your focus on how can I get out of here and stay safe. So we will be touching on those things and thank you for sharing that in the chat with us. All right, so next we're going to talk about assertiveness. And I tell you, in my uh, time of providing these trainings, um, I know for me, when I bring up assertiveness, I still get a little bit of a feeling in my gut, like, oh boy, 
I need to be assertive. How am I going to do that? How am I going to be comfortable with that? Well, that's why we talk about assertiveness is because we want to help folks become comfortable with being assertive. We're going to talk about the three types of behavioral responses that we have in an unsafe situation. So if we, if we review the spectrum of behavior, uh, we've got passive response on one end, aggressive on the other, and then in the middle is kind of that sweet spot of, of being assertive. So I'm sure you can guess if I were to ask you what's the most effective behavioral response in an unsafe situation, what's gonna keep us the safest? Is it gonna be responding in a passive way or in an aggressive way? The answer is it's going to be an assertive way. So assertiveness keeps us safest, but it can also be the hardest to put into practice. And when I say practice, I mean just that. You might need to practice to get good at it. Um, so think about what this looks like for you. When you're uh, faced with a situation that's uncomfortable or even unsafe, how do you tend to respond? I'm not going to put you on the spot, but just think about that for yourself. And think about what these different responses look like physically. What do they look like? If someone is responding in a passive way, you, you can tell physically they're likely uh, avoiding or not paying attention, maybe looking down and not making eye contact, maybe really engrossed in a book or a smartphone. Their physical um, presentation might be such that their arms are crossed, you know, real close body, uh, physically shut down, right? Everything about that person is saying, just move on to someone else. Uh, I'm not here, <laughs> right? And for some of us, that's a natural response when something gets uncomfortable. Um, for some folks, what I just described physically, that's how they're feeling internally too. Just, oh, you know, I don't want to have to deal with this. For other folks, a response might be a more aggressive response. Think about what that looks like physically. So you're likely to have someone with their shoulders back, their chest puffed up, their arms and hands are out. They might even be in kind of a fighting stance, if you will. And they're not just making eye contact, but they're going to stare right through you. We're going to deal with this uncomfortable situation right now. Bring it on. Some folks say it's like someone who's ready to fight, right? So it's aggressive. And I've had folks share in trainings. Yeah, aggressive is how I tend to respond to something that, that's uncomfortable for me. And for others, it's passive. What we want to do is encourage you to find comfort with being assertive. So what does assertive look like? Someone who is um, who's assertive physically, think about that for a moment. So someone who's assertive is displaying confidence. All right? Physically, they're paying attention to their surroundings, right? They're likely to make eye contact with someone. Um, you know, sometimes making eye contact with strangers as you're walking around might cause more engagement than you want. There's tricks to that. You could just kind of look at someone's forehead and just kind of smile and make your way. But being aware of your surroundings, um, paying attention. Being assertive also means being able to set boundaries, right? Not letting someone walk all over you and being proactive in the situation rather than reactive. And that involves some internal assertiveness, which we'll talk about. It means being able to speak calmly in a situation, even if it's a situation where someone's escalated, right? It's that being able to stay calm and speak clearly. Acting assertively is a safe way to respond to most situations because it uses clear communication. And it's a respectful way of communicating with people. So think about your own response and what's comfortable for you. Let's break this down a little bit so that if you would like to become more comfortable with being assertive, there's some tips for how you can do that. Now, the three types are internal, physical, and verbal. So internal is what our brain tells us. Internal assertiveness is positive self-talk. Think about the things you say to yourself day in and day out. 
that dialogue going on internally? Are you being kind to yourself? Can you tell yourself, I am strong. I can get through this. I will survive this. That's internal assertiveness. It's believing that we are worth taking care of, worth protecting. It's also remembering boundaries and that it's okay to enforce and maintain boundaries. It's healthy. Sometimes it's repeating those boundaries internally. You know, I have this boundary with this person. I really want to stick with it. It's important to me. It can also mean making a safety plan, right? Safety planning. That could be noting where your exits are. You know, if I needed to get out of this space, how would I do that? How could I stay safe? And it's also the ability to calm yourself, that internal peace of saying, we've got this, I'm going to be okay. I can handle this, all right? Physical, so physical is what our body says. Did you know that 80% of language is body language? So when you saw me on Zoom, you had a pretty good sense of the language I was going to speak before I even opened my mouth, right? My body language says so much. And so you want to be aware of that. Consider your posture, eye contact, face and hand positions. You know, these can all send different messages. So you want to be aware of that. And then last is verbal. What is coming out of your mouth? <laughs> you know, using your voice to set boundaries, to maintain boundaries. Be aware of your tone and volume of your voice. And ask yourself, are you comfortable using I feel statements when you're talking with people? And then there's also some tools that you can use. And one is called the three-step model. And we're going to teach you that today in this workshop. But the biggest takeaway here is that if you are internally assertive, the other things will fall into place. It's super important what you're saying to yourself internally, how you're treating yourself and how you're building up that internal assertiveness, all right? So let's go ahead and talk about the three-step model of assertiveness. And this is a wonderful tool that I'm going to introduce and it's a type of verbal assertiveness. There's many ways to be assertive. So please note that this model is used for lower level boundary setting scenarios where physical violence, is not a risk, and the people involved may need to continue to be in a relationship with each other. So you might use this three-step model with a colleague, someone in your family, a neighbor, someone you're gonna see again. It can also be adapted to many different situations. Usually we teach this model in person, in a workshop, and we have folks get in pairs and practice, but obviously we can't do that through Zoom. So. Just listen, take it in, and then if you have an opportunity after this, practice it with someone. The more you practice, the more natural it comes, and the more comfortable you become with being assertive. So the three-step model of assertiveness is just that. It's name it, so name the behavior, frame it, so set a boundary around that, and the third one is change it, enforce that boundary, okay? So I'm going to give the example of um, a colleague who really likes to give hugs. And we'll say that it's Sarah here. And we'll say that I'm really not comfortable with that, okay? So if I were to use the three-step model with Sarah, we're at work and she comes up to, to give me a big old hug. So here's how I might use this three-step model. I might say, hey, hey Sarah, I see that you're a really huggy person. I think that's really great about you. But hugging makes me uncomfortable. Do you think we could do a elbow bump instead? Okay, so I named the behavior. We like to give hugs. I framed it. It makes me uncomfortable. And I changed it. In this case, I came up with another option. How about we do an elbow bump? Now, I could have said, you like to give hugs, it makes me uncomfortable. Please stop doing it, okay? But this is someone I work with and I wanna to continue to have a great relationship with Sarah, but I would like that behavior to stop. So there's another point that I wanna make with the three-step model and that is 
I didn't criticize Sarah as a person. I really just criticized the behavior. I didn't say, hey, Sarah, you're a real creep who isn't paying attention to people. You're just giving people these hugs and you don't care. You know, I didn't criticize her. I was very clear. You like to give hugs. Makes me uncomfortable. Let's try something else. All right. So um, don't leave a step out. If you don't frame it, chances are the behavior might continue. But if you tell them why it makes you uncomfortable, it's more likely to sink in and change that behavior. And always follow your intuition. There might be times when the three-step model is just not going to work. It could maybe escalate things. Follow your intuition on that and make that choice. Sometimes maybe just moving away from a situation um, is a better way to handle that. So, um, so follow your gut and practice this three-step model. All right, um, I am seeing some notes in the chat here. Anything? Uh, looks like we have some folks sharing, tend to be more passive, um, challenge to be assertive. You know, I'll just share with you that um, I first took a women's strength self-defense class, gosh, it's probably been 15 years ago now or more, and I was not comfortable being assertive, very passive, and it has taken practice, but practice helps. It really does. It really helps. Um, so thank you for sharing folks in the chat. I really appreciate that. And we're going to move to the next section, which is de-escalation. And so Sarah is going to be sharing with you. Um, so Sarah, I will go ahead and share my screen until we get to the, the slide that we'll need you to share. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right, we're going to talk now about um, some de-escalation skills and how those can be helpful to you. Um, first, though, we want to just talk about what it means to be escalated and kind of what that looks like in somebody. So most folks have seen somebody that's escalated or has been escalated ourselves. Um, and oftentimes it's very outwardly upset. It's angry, yelling, fighting. Etc. So if those are examples of being escalated, think about what does it mean to de-escalate or what is de-escalation? Um, so what de-escalation is, is helping someone to be less upset or to calm down, um, to think and act more rationally. Uh, but that's not always possible. It's not always our job to, to do that. And it's not always um, something that we have the skills to do. Uh, so the goal is to help calm another person or situation down, not to solve their problem. So we want to think about how, what's happening in somebody's brain, you know, when this is going on, when somebody is escalated, what's going on in their brain and what are we trying to help their brain do instead? Often people are escalated because maybe some past trauma is being activated in some way. Uh, and the way we think about this is that the brain has multiple parts that do different things. Right. So when somebody is having trauma reactivated or is just extremely upset about something, oftentimes that front part of their brain, the prefrontal cortex, um, which is the part that makes rational decisions and makes plans and follows through with those plans, um, is not working so well. Right. It's kind of gone offline. The part that goes online or kind of goes in overdrive is the part that's back behind that which includes the amygdala and the hippocampus. And those parts of the brain makes, makes decisions, make decisions based on that fight or flight or freeze um, in times of fear or threat. So the amygdala is kind of exposed in a way. And that prefrontal cortex is not working properly. And that amygdala is going into overwork or overdrive because that prefrontal cortex, cortex is not working so well. Um, and the decision-making 
um, becomes more spontaneous and less rational. So we want to help people get to a place of calm that allows that prefrontal cortex to come back online and start making rational and calm decisions again. Um, and it's hard to do that. It's hard to do that if we and our prefrontal cortex aren't working so well either. And we've started relying on our amygdala and hippocampus to make those decisions for us. So it's important, and I'll talk about this in a minute, to calm ourselves down first before we have the capacity to be able to calm somebody else down. Also, when we're considering how we de-escalate a situation, we want to have some considerations for um, people's cultural identity. Some people may talk uh, with louder or softer voices or stand with different postures or within different distances of what's considered personal space. Uh, than our own. And so when they're communicating, this may look different than what we understand to be calm or not calm. Um, they may have learned a different way to communicate um, what makes sense for them that, and how they interact with other people than we have learned. So be aware and curious of how people that are from different cultures than your own um, may communicate differently. And hold space for that when you're trying to de-escalate a situation. Approach from a place of respect and patience, 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 for different styles of communication. As I mentioned before, consider that someone's appearance of being de or excuse me, being escalated may come from their trauma experience. In order to help them de-escalate, acknowledging and respecting that a person may have a trauma experience that is being activated can help make that de-escalation experience more trauma-informed and more successful for everyone involved. And this doesn't mean that you're saying it out loud necessarily. I think you're experiencing some re-traumatization. It's just acknowledging that maybe within your own mind and having patience for that. So first step in de-escalation is calming yourself down through deep breathing, body check-ins, and positive self-talk. So deep breathing, meaning those big, deep breaths that come from your belly, okay? Hugely helpful. We do not do it enough, right? Checking in with your body. Are you tense? Are you clasping your fists? Are you gritting your teeth? Is this bringing up some trauma for you? How can you address that? And using that positive self-talk that Jenny alluded to, I'm going to be okay, I am safe, I have help, I can get through this, I want to help this person, okay? So we're going to look at a video now that's just a short video about de-escalation skills, and it's going to go through a lot of the de-escalation skills that we could talk to you about but it's in a more fun and interactive video. So um, I'm going to share my screen and hopefully um, this video will work and um, you'll be able to hear and see it just fine. So here we go. Hi there. This brief video is going to describe simple calming and de-escalation strategies. When people are escalated, it often comes from a sense of threat or fear. Even if the threat is not real at the time, their past experiences with people in the world may have wired their brains to expect harm or danger. When we as humans perceive threat or are otherwise incredibly stressed or angry or scared, we activate our survival brain. This more primitive part of our brain has only one job, to keep us safe. It doesn't care about reason or logic. In fact, the thinking parts of our brain turn off and we act mostly on instincts. These instincts include reading nonverbal cues from our environment. Those nonverbal cues are actually more important than verbal cues or what people say to us. So when people are escalated at their core, they want control. We give them control over their own safety and decisions. 
Do not block people, corner them, or block entrances or possible escape routes. As soon as you do, they want to fight or flee even more. Give two arms length distance. Keep our body posture open so it does not appear that you are hiding anything. Keep your body posture as relaxed as you can, even if it's hard. A looming, towering figure only sends the message that you want to dominate. So if it feels okay to do so, ask them what would make them feel safe or feel, feel better. Put the control back on their turf. Ask what would help. Ask what could happen next. One of the most famous practices and sayings for de-escalation is low and slow from Teresa Bolick. Low and slow refers to both your body movements and your voice or speech. Just like it sounds, we want to keep the tone of our voice low and the speed of our voice slow. When you lower your tone and speed, it makes it more possible for the other person to process what you are saying and not feel threatened. As opposed to a higher pitch tone and quick speech, which frankly increases stress. Then we also try to lower and slow down our body movements and posture. So try to sit in a chair or on the floor, especially if you were children, and especially if the person who is escalated is lower down than you, maybe they're on the floor or in a chair. If you get on an even playing field, this gives the nonverbal cue that you mean no threat. And try to slow down your body movements so as to not further alarm their cues for danger. Move slowly, walk slowly, keep your hands out and open where they can see them. Next, use the tip, name it to tame it, made popular by Dan Siegel. By naming emotions, we gain control over them. Therapists have known this forever. Acknowledge that they may be feeling anxious, angry, especially if it's a child. Stay with that feeling. Validate it. Let them know the feeling is okay as long as they stay safe. We also like to say, regulate over educate. When people are in distress, it's not the time to teach or educate or think back about what they could have done differently. The only goal is to regulate their emotions. Usually this is done by giving space and time staying calm and helping provide a calming atmosphere. It takes the body 20 to 30 minutes to come back down the baseline after a perceived or an actual threat. Just think of your own situations when something really scared you or startled you. Even if you look like you're getting back to normal, your body is still pumping all those stress hormones for a while. So wait it out. Just help people regulate. If the person was aggressive or destructive, especially if it's a child, there does, of course, need to be a consequence, but wait on talking about the consequence. Finally, two of the most important things you can do all along the way, and best before people get too distressed, or even while they're distressed, is to validate their feelings and be empathic. I see you are struggling. I see this is hard. If it's okay, I'll stay here with you until you feel better. I'm going to have Jenny go ahead and share her screen again, and we'll just follow up on a few of those things that we heard about in the video. Um, so that video, just so you know, is from the Dartmouth Trauma Intervention Research Center. I think it just really illustrates in a lighthearted and easy way how de-escalation might work and feel. Um, I'm going to just go over a few of the main concepts mentioned in the video. And we can, as we continue um, with de-escalation skills. So the video alluded to that once you found an initial place of calm for yourself, you can begin to think about different forms of assertiveness and how to utilize them to help calm the other person down. Uh, we often, almost often, start with internal assertiveness. So internal assertiveness refers to those things that we can do internally to both bring our own calm to a situation and help the escalated person begin to calm down. One simple tool to consider is letting the other person just vent and potentially diffuse themselves uh, through that process. Of course, this can also involve positive self-talk and breathing on your own to keep your own calm. Once we've established that internal assertiveness, we can move towards being physically assertive. So physically assertive means using confident, calm, sincere, and alert facial expressions and posture, as they mentioned in the video, 
We want to keep our facial expressions as neutral as possible, and we can use a little trick um, to do that. So if you take the tip of your tongue and put it on the roof of your mouth, um, it makes it hard to laugh. It makes it hard to make an angry face. And it's also difficult to talk. So the tip of your tongue on the roof of your mouth, it helps you keep that focus on the person who has escalated and helps your face stay neutral. Keep your body movement slow and position yourself for safety, keeping yourself close to exits behind physical barriers if necessary. We also want to recognize that verbal assertiveness um, is a big part of doing de-escalation. So if it feels safe to engage the person in a verbal way, we can do some redirecting of their attention um, or cause a distraction. We can, maybe we see something else going on in the distance and can point it out, or we need to take a phone call. Maybe we wanna call for some help for the person. Anything that helps you take that focus off the thing that is making the person upset and can help break that cyclical nature of being escalated. You can also defer to a policy or another person in an effort to distract from the thing that is escalating the situation. Uh, if you need to lie in order to keep yourself safe or remove yourself from a situation, it's okay, it's absolutely acceptable. Um, if the person gets to a place of calm, another tool of verbal assertiveness that can be helpful is to brainstorm solutions. This is only effective though, however, if they've been able to calm down substantially. If your physical safety is at risk, as I said in the video, make sure you're keeping that two arms length away. Um, keep yourself behind physical barriers like a table, a door, foliage, uh, and keep aware of escape options at all times. If you're, and you want to, excuse me, to avoid escalating behaviors on your own part as well, such as condescending or insincere comments or remarks, body language, quick movements, laughter, and of course, just saying, just calm down, right? Because that can be very condescending and in fact can escalate a lot of folks versus helping them calm down. So when someone is altered, meaning they're under the influence of drugs or alcohol or other substances and they're in, or they're in a mental health crisis of some kind, we may have to alter our tools for de-escalation. It's important to gain distance immediately when you notice that somebody is altered. So you create more than two arms lengths away um, from the escalated individual. Maintain your awareness of what your intuition is telling you about the situation and if it's safe to attempt to de-escalate or not. Remember that negotiating might not work. Um, their conflict resolution skills may be lessened when they're altered. You may have to repeat your words for them to understand what you're trying to get them to do. You may have to use directives, such as, if I'm going to be able to help you, I need you to stop yelling and throwing things at me so that I can hear you clearly and feel safe. Acknowledging their reality by acknowledging their feelings, as it said in the video, encouraging them to find a space that feels safer, which may be very different from your own feelings um, and places of safety. If they're yelling something that doesn't feel like it's part of reality, it's okay. Accept that that's their reality. They may think somebody else is talking to them or something else is telling them something to do. And that may be really scary. So acknowledging that how scary that would be and that you want to help them and not hurt them and helping them move to a space that feels safer. Remember to breathe, right? Especially when you're trying to de-escalate someone who is altered in some way. Keep yourself calm and focused. Call for help when you need it. When you feel like you cannot handle it on your own, which may be very early on in the process with somebody who is escalated and is altered at the same time, look at finding a way to call for help. And calling for help can look like a lot of different things. It can be calling a supervisor, a colleague, a family member, a crisis line, Portland Street Response, 911, non-emergency. What is that way that you're going to get more people involved in the situation so that you don't have to do it on your own? All right, we're gonna move into talking about escape options. I'm gonna share my screen and Jenny's gonna to talk to us about six escape options that we might have available for us when a situation becomes physically unsafe for us. Thank you, Sarah. And I'm going to be moving through these fairly quickly. I just want to do a time check. We have just under 10 minutes to go and quite a bit of presentation to cover. So I would encourage you to reach out to us if you would like to um, have a full workshop for you and a community group or you and your neighbors or a workshop for your staff. 
whatever the case may be, we're happy to work with you and do a full workshop. Escape options we're gonna talk about. So we're looking at moving away, verbal defense, unexpected behavior, waiting as an escape option, weapons and fighting. Now these are just options, folks. And there might be other things that you can think of that could get, help keep you safe, get you out of a situation. And we want you to follow your intuition, okay? But we're just adding some things to your toolbox um, here with these uh, additional options. Um, they're most effective when you can consider the risks and benefits ahead of time. And then when it's time to use them, you have a, a, a sense of what's going to be the right fit for you in that moment. Just know that using multiple escape options together increases our chances of getting out of an unsafe situation easier. Um, and these are presented in no particular order other than weapons and fighting. We talk about those last as we consider those a last resort. They're they put us at higher risk of physical and emotional harm. Moving away is an option that's most intuitive for folks. You're, you're doing this already and you're not even thinking about it. It's creating space between ourselves and danger or ourselves and something that's uncomfortable, right? It could be running, speed walking, hiding, jumping, crawling, just backing up a couple of feet. Um, if you think about the benefits, yeah, it's easy. It's intuitive. It's something we do without really thinking about it, but there can be some risks. Uh, what if you don't have a place to move away to, right? What if you're kind of stuck? Um, what if there's mobility challenges? So moving it away is just may not be an option. Um, or you don't have a safer space to move into. Uh, also know that moving away combined with other escape options, such as waiting or verbal defense, could be very effective. And so let's move on to the next um, consideration, which is verbal defense for an escape option. This is using our voice to help us escape from an unsafe situation. Many times, this is using our voice to yell, um, to make statements or commands, to tell an attacker that they're making us feel unsafe and to stop their behavior. A lot of, uh, oftentimes we think of verbal defense as yelling things such as no and back off. I'm calling 911. Stop following me. And that's very powerful, that human voice. But verbal defense can also include things like negotiating and using verbal assertiveness to help us escape. Uh, it can help slow down an attacker. It can also help draw attention and get help from others. But just remember this, if you're going to use verbal defense to ask for help from others, passersby, be specific and clear about what you need and who you need it from. So uh, rather than yelling, call 911, how about this? Hey, you in the red jacket, call 911. This person is touching me. So it's very specific, right? Um, sometimes people say, what if I just yell fire? Well, do people run to a fire or run away from a fire? Also, if you want people to call 911 for you to help you, you want them to report what's actually happening. They're gonna call and say there's a fire when really you might need a different type of help. So be specific, be clear, just know that with verbal defense, um, for some folks, it might not be a, a good option. You may not have a strong voice. Maybe you have a fear reaction. That means that when you go to yell for help, nothing happens, nothing comes out. Or maybe um, there's a disability that prevents you from using your voice. So consider ahead of time things you can use like noisemakers um, that can replace your voice, a whistle or a personal alarm. There's many different options out there. You just want to research those and have them ready for when you need it. Unexpected behavior. You know, unexpected behavior is an option that creates surprise for an attacker. And it often buys us time to use those other options to escape. Unexpected behavior can look like a lot of different things. And we usually hear from the audience a lot of different ideas. Um, but moving along, I'll just tell you that Unexpected behavior could be something as simple as moving from the sidewalk to walk in the middle of the street. Or maybe it's yelling when you're expected to be quiet, right? And submit to an attack. So it, it can be any number of things that are unexpected in that moment. 
Unexpected behavior gives us the opportunity to be creative, to create a distraction. There are some risks. Could an unexpected behavior possibly escalate things? Yeah, yeah, it could. If an attacker is expecting that you're gonna be quiet and you start yelling and screaming at the top of your lungs, that might really tick them off, him or her or whatever the situation is, it could make it worse, right? You have to follow your intuition on what you're gonna do to stay safe, but it can buy us some more time. But if we also spend too much time thinking about an unexpected behavior, we might lose awareness of other options that we have to escape the situation. Waiting is one of the most misunderstood and misinterpreted of the escape options, and, and it really is. It's exactly as it sounds though. It means waiting for help, waiting for an attacker to become distracted waiting for someone to walk by to get help from. You know, waiting can be waiting for a moment, minutes or days. In the case of intimate relationships where there's violence, it can be waiting for years to utilize some escape options. It can help us gain awareness of all the options we have while we're waiting. It can help prevent further attack. Waiting is an active choice. And I wanna say that again, waiting is an active choice and it can give us time to observe, collect, or leave evidence. Observe characteristics of an attacker to help provide a positive ID. And you know what you can do while you're waiting? You can use that positive self-talk, that internal assertiveness can kick in. I'm gonna get through this, I'm going to survive. I can do this, I'm going to be okay, all right? But there are some risks with waiting. If we wait too long, we could risk more physical harm, right? And emotional harm that comes with the trauma of that experience. And what if we wait? Will others possibly second guess us? Might you second guess yourself? Yeah, and that's really tough stuff, right? You know, people saying, why'd you wait so long? Or why didn't you get help? Why didn't you do this or that? But this is an active choice that can help you to survive. When you combine waiting and other escape options, you can have a really effective response in an unsafe situation. All right, the last two sections, weapons and fighting. So with weapons, we consider those to be in two categories. You have conventional, traditional weapons, such as guns, knives, pepper spray, tasers. And then there's weapons of opportunity, right? It's anything around you that could be used as a weapon. I I happen to have a pen, I have scissors, I have a hot cup of coffee. Look around your space and think about what you have that could be used as a weapon of opportunity. Chairs, pens, keys in your workspace, you know, cleaning supplies, chemicals that you could spray. Um, you can get creative. Look around though when you're not in a moment of crisis and consider what could you use if you needed to. Look, weapons can be effective, and you put 110% of your effort into using them. It's not a kind of sort of maybe thing. It's 110% commitment. They're designed to incapacitate an attacker so that we can escape quickly. And um, the good thing about weapons of opportunity is they're readily available and they can be just as effective as conventional weapons. But there are some risks with using weapons. Legal implications, right? Or lack of training. Or what if the weapon is used against us? It's, it's taken from us and used against us and not in our defense. Or what if it malfunctions, right? So just think about it this way. If you're going to choose to use weapons in your self-defense, um, get training on that. Know how to uh, be trained, how to use it, how to store it properly. Do everything you can to be proficient in using that if that's your choice. Um, just know we are more likely to be attacked by someone we know. Therefore, if you um, use a weapon against someone, it might be against someone you care about, and it could result in serious injury or death. Those are things to calculate carefully. And then finally, with fighting, similar to weapons, fighting is something that can be effective, very effective if you put 110% of your effort into it. Uh, it's much more than punching and kicking. It involves specific strikes to specific target areas on an attacker to incapacitate so you can get the heck out of there. 
Fighting shows strength and purpose in our defense. It can also be an unexpected behavior. If an attacker does not have a clue you're trained in self-defense, that would be unexpected, right? And um, just know that similar to weapons, fighting can be legally messy, of course. It puts you at risk of more emotional and physical harm. If you're gonna choose to fight, you are going to get hurt. Uh, if you wanna learn some introductory self-defense training, you can reach out to the Women's Strength Program. They have classes. Uh, I think they're virtual and I think they plan to go uh, in person again soon. And it is, um, it's free and you can take it as many times as you want. So, all right, we're gonna transition back over to Sarah here. And she's going to talk to you briefly about what we call upstander intervention. All right, so we are at 11.03 right now, but I, I understand that we have a little bit more time that we can um, finish up the presentation with. So if you're able to stick with us, great. Um, we are just gonna be here a little bit longer. Um, so upstander intervention, what is this? So um, I want you to think about how you identify your authentic self. What does that mean? So it's kind of what, is your identity, right? So some folks identify very strongly with their gender identity. Some folks identify very strongly with their racial or cultural identity. Um, for some, it's a disability that they may have that they identify very strongly with. Um, and think about if whatever your identity is, can you be that authentic identity and authentic self in public? And why or why not? Um, so many people who cannot hide uh, who they are um, and who that authentic self is or who that authentic identity is, um, fear being their authentic selves in public. And that's because they are often more likely to be targeted because of who their authentic self and identity is. Um, so not everyone can hide this authentic self or identity. And we wanna be allies for those folks that cannot hide it and who may be more vulnerable or more likely to be targeted for harassment or attack. When we decide to act as an upstander or an ally, we agree to share the risk with the person who is being targeted. Okay, this does not mean you're taking on the whole burden of it, um, that you're um, being some kind of superhero, <laughs> but, the goal is just to reduce that impact on everyone that's involved in the situation in some way, okay? So with that, what are some things we can do to get involved as an upstander? Involvement and upstanding may look different for everyone. Everyone has different levels of comfort. Everyone has different boundaries. So make a plan and decide what feels safe for you. Think about the situations that you may be regularly in where you may be looked at as an upstander or may have the desire to act as an upstander and what you can do in those situations. One way to become an upstander is to get training about how to interrupt oppression, okay? So this means get education, take a training, read a book, something that tells you some tools for interrupting oppressive comments and oppressive behavior. Because a lot of times that's what this is about. Somebody is oppressing somebody else with their comments or their behavior or their threats. Make time to learn and practice this concept of interrupting oppression. Think about your de-escalation skills that we've talked about, how you can use those to work as an upstander. Provide support for the person that's being targeted. Sit with them, stand with them, talk to them. Help mobilize others to help if it doesn't feel safe to approach that person who is being targeted or approaching the attacker. You can create distractions and allow opportunities for the other person to potentially escape. You can use your own escape options if you need to get out of the situation. Make sure that if you choose to act as an upstander, 
you seek aftercare in the form of emotional or physical support for you and for others involved if you're able to. We all have the opportunity to act as an upstander in some way, shape, or form, but it doesn't have to look the same for everyone. All right, we are almost done. And so we're going to think about our what ifs and what we were thinking about at the beginning of this training and this presentation. And what were our safety concerns coming into this? And have we been able to think about some options for addressing those safety concerns? So when you're thinking about your what ifs and you're making a plan for your safety, think about options for reducing the risk of being in that situation. What are some things that you can do that reduce excuse me, reduce the possibility that you might be in that situation in the first place? What are some things you can do? What are some options you have for surviving if you are in that situation? And what are some options for healing? So you've survived, but now, now comes the time when you have to think about what has happened to you and how you can move forward, how you can go back to the same space where something potentially happened in, how you can heal. Remember to use any of these options that you've heard about today and know that they may not always work all the time, but oftentimes you can use so many of the options together for your safety plan. Keep that positive self-talk and know that you are worth it. You are worth taking care of. You are worth keeping yourself safe. safe. 